ASMR True Crime Channel. Today, we're diving into a chilling mystery that shook Long Island, New York, the baffling case of Shannon Gilbert. What initially seemed like a straightforward missing persons case took a dark turn, unveiling a series of unsolved murders that sent shockwaves through the community. The Long Island serial killer remains at large, leaving us with more questions than answers. Get ready for a deep dive into the twists and turns of this haunting mystery. But before we begin, if you're as intrigued by true crime, mysteries, and ASMR as I am, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and join our community. Now let's unravel the enigma of Shannon Gilbert's disappearance. Shannon Maria Gilbert was born on October 24, 1986, in the city of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. She was the daughter of Mary Gilbert and had four more sisters, Sarah, Sher, and Stevie Smith Gilbert. I couldn't find any information about Shannon's dad, let alone who he is. Shannon had a turbulent childhood. As soon as her mother separated from her father, she moved to upstate New York with her daughters. In New York, the girls were separated from their mother and placed in an orphanage. A short time later, Mary's youngest daughters, Sharon and Stevie, returned to her guardianship, while the oldest, Shannon and Sarah, remained in an orphanage and later passed through some foster homes. One of Shannon's foster mothers described her as a cheerful, smart girl who even managed to get through two years of classes in one while in high school. The same adoptive mother kept in touch with her in the later years, and according to people close to her, the two were very attached. As a teenager, Shannon was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and started taking medication for it, but she stopped taking it claiming that the medication made her tremble. After graduating from high school, Shannon worked in a few places to earn money. She was a receptionist at a hotel, a clerk at a store, and also worked as a snack preparer at a center for the elderly. Later in the year 2007, she moved to her boyfriend in Jersey City, a city located in the state of New Jersey. In Jersey City, Shannon joined a call girl agency while trying to become a professional singer and actress. A call girl, for those who don't know, is like an escort service. Her story as a call girl was as turbulent as her childhood. She was arrested at least once, and on one occasion she was so badly beaten that she needed a titanium plate in her jaw. According to reports at the same time, she started using narcotics. Shannon advertised her services on the internet for $1.200 an hour. She kept two-thirds of what she received, and the remaining third was pocketed by her driver, a man named Michael Pack, who accompanied her to the site and also acted as a kind of security if necessary. In just one night, Shannon raised over $600, and it kind of blew her away. Soon she spent her money on expensive things, moved to a bigger and better place, and showered her birth mother, sisters, and nephews with gifts. She also started taking classes at an online college in hopes of graduating and not having to work as a call girl one day. Her mother knew about her work and tried to get her to quit, but Shannon said she couldn't stop because she needed the money. On May 1st, 2010, 24-year-old Shannon Maria Gilbert disappeared without a trace. As soon as she was unable to contact her daughter, Mary Gilbert contacted the local police to report her disappearance. According to investigations, Shannon was last seen near Hugo Beach on Long Island, New York, after meeting with a client. Jersey City, where she lived, is located right on the border of the states of New Jersey and New York, so it was common for her to also have clients in the neighboring state. The distance from Jersey City to Long Island is about 90 kilometers, a journey that can be done in one and a half hours by car. We can say there is a relatively short time distance for American standards. 
later, detectives discovered the identity of the client who was with Shannon hours before she disappeared. It was Joseph Brewer, a resident of Oak Beach, a gated community located in Long Island. In the position, Joseph told investigators that he had indeed engaged Shannon and that he was with her the night she disappeared. He said that a few minutes after the young woman arrived at his house, she started acting strange and had what he described as a panic attack. In the sequence, she would have run out of the house without giving any explanation, leaving him alone in the place. Joseph also said he didn't know the young woman and that he hired her through a website called Craigslist. When she ran away, he contacted her driver, Michael Pack, and canceled the date. And guys, for those who don't know, Craigslist is a classified ad site where people advertise items they want to sell or buy. On this site, people also usually advertise in higher services, such as painting maintenance, gardening, and let's say more differentiated services, such as call girls. During investigations, it was discovered that Shannon made a 911 call while still inside Joseph's residence. In the call, it was recorded, as well as all the calls that are made to the emergency. The woman says that she's being pursued and that they are trying to catch her. However, she cannot give any details, let alone explain the situation better, speaking some rambling things, hinting that she might be hallucinating. Detectives also discovered that after the young woman ran out of Joseph's house, she started hitting the neighboring houses that are in the condominium. According to reports from these residents, the young woman seemed upset and very afraid. She ran from one side to the other, asking for help, saying that they were trying to catch her. Some of them, seeing the scene, decided to call the police. However, when the police team arrived and carried out a small search in the area, they couldn't find a young woman anywhere. In later days, detectives investigated Joseph Brewer, who until then was the prime suspect in the disappearance of Shannon Gilbert. However, detectives found no physical evidence that could actually link the man to the disappearance, and he was ruled out as a suspect. In the days that followed, the police began to show little interest in the case, practically dropping it. Mary Gilbert, Shannon's mother, always made a point of following investigations from the beginning. After all, it was her daughter who was missing. With that, she soon noticed this lack of interest from the authorities, and, fearing that her daughter's case would be forgotten, should turn to the press, to the media. Mary said that the police were not taking her daughter's case seriously because she was working as a call girl. She also said that no matter what she had to do, she would go all the way to put pressure on the authorities so that her daughter's case wouldn't be forgotten. Mary Gilbert's appeals had an effect in the eyes of the press, and the population turned to the local authorities but began to be pressured to find the missing girl. Before long, search teams were assembled and began scouring the area where Shannon was last seen, but what they found was something much worse. On December 10, 2010, as teams searched the Kyoko Beach area, a sniffer dog indicated a location where something was buried. When digging this place, the police found a body belonging to a woman. Initially, authorities believed it to be Shannon Gilbert, but after DNA analysis, it was confirmed that the body belonged to another woman named Melissa Bartholomew. Melissa Bartholomew was 24 years old and lived in the Bronx in New York. Like Shannon, she was also a call girl and also advertised her services on Craigslist. Melissa was last seen on the night of July 10, 2009. On that day, she had met with a client, deposited $900 into his bank account, and then tried to call her ex-boyfriend, but to no avail. A week after her disappearance, her teenage sister, a girl named Amanda, began receiving a series of calls from a man using the victim's cell phone. 
In these calls, the man mocked and cursed the girl, asked if she was also working as a call girl, and if so, she would have the same terrible fate as her sister, implying that he had taken Melissa's life. These calls went on for five long weeks, and if it wasn't enough, the pain that Melissa's family was feeling because they didn't know what had happened to her, they still had to deal with this madman. The police even tracked down these calls at the time, which pointed to somewhere in Midtown Manhattan and Massapequa in New York, but they were unable to locate the person responsible for them. After the discovery of Melissa, the police returned to the same area to continue the search. On December 13, 2010, not far from the location where Melissa was found, police officers made three more macabre discoveries. That's right, there were three more bodies buried in that same area, and they all belonged to women. Later, after analysis, the bodies were identified as Maureen Brainerd Barnes, Megan Waterman, and Amber Lynn Costello, who were all call girls and advertised their services on Craigslist. Maureen Brainerd Barnes was 25 years old and lived in the city of Norwich in the state of Connecticut, which is about 150 kilometers from Long Island. She was last seen on July 9, 2007, saying that she planned to spend the day in New York, after which she was never seen again. The young woman was a mother of two. She had worked as a call girl in the past and had stopped for some time. However, she had returned to work after receiving an eviction notice. Maureen's intention was to raise some quick cash to pay the rents and not get evicted along with her kids. The other victim, Megan Waterman, was 22 years old and a resident of the city of South Portland in the state of Maine, which is about 470 kilometers from Long Island. She was last seen on June 6, 2010, while staying at a motel in Hoboken, New York. She had a daughter and also a boyfriend whom she called before to let him know she was leaving and would call him later. But as we know, she never called again. Lastly, we have Amber Lynn Costello, a 27-year-old girl who lived in the city of North Babylon in New York, which is just 25 kilometers from Long Island. She disappeared on September 2, 2010, after meeting a client who reportedly called her several times, saying he would pay $1,500 for her services. Initially, Amber's family thought she was in a rehab center as the young woman was addicted to narcotics. For this reason, they only informed the authorities about her disappearance months later. These four victims that were found by the authorities became known as the Four Jayogo, a reference to Jones Beach, the area where they were found on Long Island. As you can see, they all had one thing in common. They were all young call girls who advertised their services on Craigslist. In addition, some of them were inside burlap bags, indicating that perhaps the person responsible for these crimes worked with something that used this type of bag. At this point, the authorities already knew they were dealing with a serial criminal. They had gone in search of a missing young woman, and now they had four bodies in their hands, thus making things a lot more serious. As soon as this information became public, the attention of the entire country turned to Long Island. The press quickly went to the area where the police made the terrible discoveries and began to search the place in a kind of treasure hunt. They were intent on finding any evidence or even another body, which would somehow bring them a lot of audience. In the months that followed, the police focused their investigations on every piece of evidence they found. However, they came up with nothing that would lead them to the person responsible for these crimes. The search for Shannon Gilbert continued, and in March and April 2011, six more bodies were found, bringing the total to ten victims. Of these six bodies, four were adult females. 
One was an Asian adult male, and the other was a two- to four-year-old girl. Only two of the six could be identified, being Jessica Taylor and Valerie Mack. Jessica was 20 years old and lived in Manhattan, New York, about 90 kilometers from Long Island. She disappeared in July 2003, and on July 26th of the same year, only her trunk was found 72 kilometers from Jones Beach. Like the other victims, Jessica was also a call girl. The other identified victim, Valerie Mack, was a 24-year-old girl who lived in the city of Philadelphia in the state of Pennsylvania, about 250 kilometers from Long Island. She was also a call girl and was last seen near the city of Port Republic in the state of New Jersey. Valerie disappeared in the year 2000, and on November 19th of the same year, her torso was found wrapped in garbage bags that had been thrown in a forest that is crossed by a highway in Manor View, New York. Later, her other parts were found on Jones Beach, as I mentioned, but until then, they had not been identified, something that happened only in May 2020. Prior to identification, authorities referred to Valerie Mack as Jane Doe, number six. The remaining victims were named Jane Doe, number three, Baby Doe, John Doe, and Jane Doe, number seven. During investigations, it was discovered that the torso of Jane Doe, number three, had already been found 14 years earlier, on June 28, 1997, at Hempstead Lake State Park in South County, New York. It was also discovered that she and Baby Doe were mother and daughter, were wearing similar jewelry, and were African American. The other victim, John Doe, was an Asian man aged between 17 and 23. He was dressed as a woman and had suffered blunt trauma to the head region. As for Jane Doe, number seven, she was a Caucasian female aged between 20 and 50 years old. According to the investigations after DNA analysis, it was confirmed that other parts of her had already been found in April 1996. Also, according to the investigations, the victim had a surgical scar on her left leg. Now the police had ten victims on their hands, and they had no idea who was responsible for it. In addition to these victims, there were five others that authorities found years ago and believed to be linked to the same serial criminal. Of these five other victims, three have been identified, and the other two, the identities still remain a mystery. The three victims identified were Tina Elizabeth Foglia, a 19-year-old girl who was last seen in February 1982. She had hitched a ride from her home to the Hammerheads Rock Festival to see her friend play. Later, several parts of her were found in different locations near Jones Beach. Police believe she may have been one of the serial killer's first victims, but they don't rule out the possibility that she was the victim of someone else. The other identified victim that I couldn't find pictures is Andrew Isaac, a 25-year-old professional drag queen known by his stage name Sugar Bear. Andre was last seen in November 2002 in eastern New York. Later, like Tina Foglia, various parts of him were found in different locations. The third identified victim is Tanya Rush, a 39-year-old woman who was last seen around 3 a.m. on June 23, 2008, walking towards a subway station in Brooklyn, New York. A few days later, on June 27, a cleaning crew found her split into pieces inside a suitcase near a park in New York. Tanya was a mother of three, a Salvation Army volunteer, and a telemarketer. According to investigators, she started working as a call girl to support her addiction. The other two victims who were not identified were named the Unknown Woman of Leading Town and the Unknown Woman of Memoric. According to detectives, the unknown woman of Leading Town was in her twenties and thirties and was possibly of 
Asian origin. Her remains were found by a woman walking her dog on January 23, 2013, in a small patch of brush along the coast at the end of Sheep Lane in New York. As for the unknown woman of Memoric, detectives believed she is a light-skinned Hispanic or African-American woman. She had a tattoo of two cherries on her left breast, which caused detectives to also call her Cherries. Like the other victims, she was also split, and some of her parts were found in the year 2007 in several different locations. The media made a point of covering every step and every discovery by the authorities. The people of Long Island and the surrounding area were very scared, and rightfully so, as there was a serial criminal on the loose who had an extensive knowledge of the area and had been at work for years. Searches continued, and on December 13th, 2011, Shannon Gilbert's body was found in a swamp in Oak Beach, half a mile from where she disappeared. Days earlier, her closing belongings had been found nearby. For the authorities, Shannon's case had been accidental. According to them, after she ran out of her client's house and knocked on the neighbor's doors, she entered the surrounding woods, and because it was dark, she didn't see the swamp when she tripped and fell into it. The coroner ruled that her cause of death was inconclusive, and ultimately, detectives said that there was no evidence linking Shannon's case to the other Jones Beach crimes. Despite these conclusions from the authorities, the young woman's family didn't accept the official version. To them, her behavior the night she disappeared and her 911 calls indicated that something happened to her that night. In addition, a doctor who previously worked with the Suffolk County Police Department, who were responsible for an investigation, became involved in Shannon's case. This doctor's name is Peter Hackett, and he lives in the same condo as Joseph Brewer, the client Shannon went to meet the day she disappeared. In that call, Peter would have told her that he ran a kind of shelter for rebellious girls and that Shannon was in his care. Wanted by the police to provide clarification on this story, Peter denied having called Mary and also denied having had any contact with her daughter. However, records from his home showed that he had indeed called and talked to Mary Gilbert and that ended up putting him in hot water. Mary believed that Peter had injected her daughter with some substance in order to calm her down, but the effect of the substance ended up contributing to the young woman's death. With that, Mary Gilbert and her lawyer filed a lawsuit against Peter Hackett. The detectives later ruled Peter out as a suspect, claiming he had a history of inserting himself into certain important events in an attempt to gain attention. Of course, this didn't go down very well for the department, and soon the media and the population started accusing the police of protecting the doctor. In the end, things came to an end, and Peter Hackett was never charged with a crime, but Shannon's family didn't rest and decided to carry out a parallel investigation. With the help of John Ray, the family's attorney, they hired Michael Payton, an independent medical examiner who was tasked with reanalyzing Shannon's body. In that new analysis that took place in 2016, Michael was unable to determine whether Shannon had been a victim of a crime or not due to the lack of soft tissue. However, he stated that Shannon's cause of death was not because of tripping and falling into the swamp water, but because of an injury she suffered to a bone in her neck, which may have been caused by someone else. This challenged the official version of the authorities and opened the door to other theories, but nothing advanced. As for the other victims, the detectives believed belonged to the same criminal. Authorities continued to investigate. In December 2015, it was announced that the FBI officially entered the case. They had already helped in the search for victims, but had never officially participated in investigations. The 
announcement came a day after former police chief James Burke, in charge of the investigations, was indicted for civil rights violations and conspiracy. James, who had resigned from the department in October 2015, reportedly blocked the FBI's involvement in the cases for several years. He was arrested and sentenced to 46 months in federal prison. James Burke's attempt to prevent the FBI from entering the case raised suspicions that he was trying to hide something and that perhaps it was directly linked to the crimes. An investigation into this theory was carried out, but authorities found no evidence that James was linked to the crimes. Another suspect was investigated. His name was James Bissett a businessman whose business was a plant nursery that was the main supplier of the leader in the region. He became a suspect after taking his own life once Shannon was discovered. In addition, many parts of the victims were found inside burlap sacks used to put burlap, something James Bissett worked with. Initially, Detectives believed that James would have taken his own life out of fear of being arrested after the discovery of several bodies. However, authorities were unable to find evidence to link him to the crimes. Later, in September 2017, the Suffolk County District Attorney announced that John Pitrolf was responsible for at least one of the Gilgo Beach crimes. John Pitrolf is a serial criminal sentenced to 50 years for the crime against two women, Rita Tangredi and Colleen McNamee, both call girls. The crimes took place in 1993 and 1994 in New York. John is still suspected of a third murder against a woman named Sandra Costelia that took place in 1993. Although authorities believe that John may be responsible for just one of the Jones Beach crimes, many believe he's actually responsible for all of them, with the exception of Shannon Gilbert. However, so far nothing has been confirmed. Returning to the case of Shannon Gilbert, Mary continues to fight so that her daughter wouldn't be forgotten, but another tragedy shook the family and would make it impossible for Mary to continue with their fight. On July 23, 2016, Sarah Gilbert, one of Mary's daughters, freaked out and attacked her with a melee weapon, taking her life. When health arrived, it was too late that nothing could be done. According to the coroner's report, Mary had 227 injuries to her body caused by a sharp object with a blade. She was also hit multiple times by a fire extinguisher. Sarah Gilbert was arrested the same day. According to investigations, she is schizophrenic and has stopped taking her medication. She had already passed through several psychiatric institutions. During her trial, her defense argued that she would not be tired as she was unable to discern her actions due to schizophrenia. In August 2017, Sarah Gilbert was found guilty by jury trial and sentenced to 25 years in prison. With the departure of Mary Gilbert, efforts to unravel the crime against her daughter diminished. In the case, like the others in Google Beach, remains unknown to this day. In June 2019, a proposal was made by Suffolk County Police Department to use the genetic genealogy method. Genetic genealogy was already held to solve several cases that were unsolved for years. With it, it's possible to identify the unidentified victims and possibly the person responsible for all these crimes. I didn't find information if the authorities are already using this method, but if they are, I believe that soon we'll have news about this case. In 2020, Suffolk Police announced that they had found a belt with the initials WAH or HM along with one of the victims. At the time the bodies were discovered, they believe that this belt may belong to the criminal and that these initials are the initials of his name. 
Despite having had this evidence in their hands for years, the authorities only decided to release it later, and they hoped that someone would know who this belt would belong to at investigations into it didn't reality results. Also in 2020, Netflix released a documentary film, Lost Girls. It is based on the book of the same name, which tells the story in detail regarding the events that follow the disappearance of Shannon Gilbert. For anyone interested in developing deeper into this story, I recommend it. Well, folks, that's it for today. Please consider subscribing if you want to hear more stories. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.